Hello Pulp Hounds. So what makes a book cover bad? There's lots of elements that can ruin a book or at least make it a little bit laughable. But before we get into that, let's have a word from today's sponsor. Don't worry, he's been round here all week. Chuck him some crisps, that'll keep him quiet. No, that's no good. It wasn't crunchy enough. It's not KP. Chuck him one of those. Go on, any flavour will do. What did I tell you? KP crisps? I don't think it's the only thing he comes here for. Down, boy, down. When it comes to the crunch, it's KP. So, composition and placement can be everything. For example, this gentleman who finds himself tiny and unclothed. And unfortunately, his little finger is big enough to suitably cover his uh, gentleman's appendage. That's never, uh, that's never good, is it? Poor lad. Sometimes an artist just simply runs out of time. So we want a wall of serpents for the book cover. A wall of serpents. Yeah, I've got you, mate. Yeah, can do this. Draws kind of the ones in the right-hand side. It wastes a bit of time. Procrastinates. Deadlines tomorrow. Oh, I'll just put some fuzzy serpents in. And that dude's sword is woefully inadequate for battling a wall of serpents, isn't it? Or, how's the book cover coming? Great. The serpent on the front is going to be so beautiful. I'm doing every individual scale. Every individual scale kind of like different colours. It's going to look like a stained glass window on it. That's great. But don't spend too much time on that so you haven't got enough time to make sure the rest of the cover's nice. No, I won't. I won't leave it, so I have to rush and essentially just scribble, like, the rest of the things on the book cover. Sometimes there's an element that's just baffling. Like, this guy. And... <laughs> this charming and comely lady. I'm sure there's a relevance in the book as to why she has such a startling appearance. Or sometimes it's just baffling. The whole thing is just baffling. Yeah. <laughs> Case in point, the war book. Now, I, I I always save book covers that, for whatever reason, make me laugh. And sometimes it's a, it's, it's a competent illustration. It's really good. If you take uh, Clifford Simak's uh, 1980 book, The Visitors, I mean, the library, uh, the library journal called it one of the most engaging novels of alien invasion ever written. And it's uh, it's a really interesting book, actually. I'm not a big sci-fi fan, but it's kind of like the aliens come and they are very alien and we don't even know if they're here because they're essentially, like, so alien to us, we, we struggle to perceive them. But they give us gifts and trinkets as humans... And we just lap it up. It's our rampant consumerism. And the reader knows that the aliens are working towards like a sinister end result. But the humans in the book are just obsessed with, with receiving these gifts and trinkets and advancements. And as much as it is a sci-fi novel, it's also a reflection on... Uh, like our consumerist society, it's, it's, I right enjoyed it. 
So how is it sold? Fishing. Fishing. Not the most dynamic and exciting of covers when it's fishing. And then you get publishers that maybe don't always pay the attention that they should. Now, I love Badger books, and I would love a big collection of Badger books. But they are getting a bit pricey, and space is at a premium on bookcases. And with my New English Library obsession, which it is, I can't afford to start collecting another publisher whose prices are increasing. But Badger books are so cool. I love this one. She's obviously scared. There's a mummy. It's like, oh my word, there's a mummy. But don't worry, love, because his legs are still wrapped together. So you could, like, estimate his height, step round him. He's not going anywhere apart from just face planting if he tries to move. Well, then we've got this guy with this weird head placement. It's not quite right. The whole placement on this is just wrong because it kind of looks like she's farting him out maybe he's like a representation this is a visual representation of what happens after you've been to taco bell there's this dude peeping at the rears of uh, some comely young ladies can't knock him for that really but he's having a little peep there's this scary ghost that's just been caught that, this is why the woman's looking shocked, because she's just caught this dude having a little dig up there. Pick me a winner, mate. Were you picking your nose then? No, no, I was uh, just scratching me top lip. No, you were, you were gonna, you were gonna go in for a pick then. No, no, no. I'm a terror ghost. I'm the main scary ghost of the uh, novel, and I just literally had an itchy nose. I wasn't gonna pick it. Do ghosts pick their nose? Apparently so, because this is documentary proof. And then there was that time this dude was hiding in a graveyard which housed the kind of ruins of a mini Stonehenge, which was also in the grounds of a castle. Just cover all bases, lads, that's brilliant. And then this ancient Greek warrior popped up out of a grave and did a happy dance. Sometimes current trends inspire um, bad book covers, or at least dubious book covers. Like, from the publishers of Star Wars. Now, Damnation Alley is an alright novel. No problems with that, but that is so very, very tenuous, isn't it? Like, it's the publisher of Star Wars. It's not any creative mind. It just so happens that Sphere published the novelisation of Star Wars. Brilliant. Or this attempt to sell more copies of Heinlein's Number of the Beast by including a kind of chubby, squished-up Stormtrooper. Or Planet Drabos with the goofiest Vader I think I've ever seen. He's so cool. He should have been like that in the movies. No, I... I'm your father, with his mad googly eyes. One of my favourite Star Wars knockoff covers is, I mean, it's a key book of weird fiction and a lot of kids read it at school, especially when I was at school, and it's The Weird Stone of Brisingaman. It started my interest in, uh, in weird fiction. It genuinely did. So the best way to market it? Vader. With a raven, obviously, because he had ravens in Star Wars. But just to cover all the bases, let's just make sure we get, like, the most double-top cash-in that we can do. Let's just have, like, Gimli and Gandalf in the background, just getting ready. I don't know if they're going to come and fight Vader. That would be so cool. You see, if that was the novel, that would be a very different novel. But I'd love to see that. Who would win? Between Gandalf and Vader. Mmm. And then there's one of my all-time favourite books in the world. 
just for its like, what is going on cover? And that's a book of charms and changelings, which avoids the whole Vader and Stormtrooper thing and just goes straight for a little tiny Yoda being swaddled by an Elizabethan duck. Because, yeah. And then sometimes it's a series. Now, <laughs> I know Jeffrey Lord's Richard Blade series is meant to be a bit spicy. It's like spicy barbarian actions. But if you can fashion, on this world that he exists in, if you can fashion forged weapons, then surely, surely you can create, literally, a rudimentary pair of Y fronts. You don't have to pretend you're wearing pants by using a lady to drape herself around your midriff and essentially pretend to be your pants. Like, these dudes have got armour. On this world, forged weapons and armour is obviously a thing. So Richard Blade chooses to wade into battle completely in the nip. It just strikes me as horribly impractical. Even this dude has got, like, fur pants and he gets, like, extra points because he's got such a splendid moustache. So that provides some kind of armour as well. And then there's Kindle editions. Now, I love Kindle editions because when something's gone out of print, out of copyright, it seems like a fishing for cash type thing when people will upload a Kindle edition for very, very cheap in the hopes of just making an extra few quid and trying to tempt people into buying these older works. And one, uh, one book I really loved when I was a lot younger was Oscar Wilde's The Picture of Dorian Gray. And it's the story of a chap who uh, never, never ages to the point where people begin to question it and it's almost like a sinister thing. Why is this guy not ageing? And it turns out he's got a painting of himself cloistered away in which he looks... Uh, a little bit tired and like he's not had a shave for a couple of days. That's the big reveal. But if that's not enough for you, how about the uncensored version? I love it in this, how they pay lip service to the picture of Dorian Gray by literally putting like a tiny corner of a picture frame right in the top corner. It's brilliant. Oh, the version where Dorian Gray was a hipster and his magical painting was stopping him turning into an older hipster. Or even just stopping him turning into a tattooed hipster that's been on fire for some reason. There's also the time when Dorian Gray was that Bradley Pitts. I love that. It's just like, <laughs> just Brad Pitt. Just put Brad Pitt on it. Someone will buy it. Oh, the best one. The very best Kindle edition of the picture of Dorian Gray was created by somebody who has never read the picture of Dorian Gray. They've just looked at the title. Yeah. One of my favourite books is The Yellow Wallpaper by Charlotte Perkins Gilman. And it's it's quite short. It's not even like a novel. It's not a novella. It's more of a, a short story, kind of given the length of like short stories nowadays. But it's wonderful. It's a Victorian uh, short story. And it's about a lady that's uh, assumed to be insane by all the men in her life. And it criticises the patriarchy and religion 
and uh, man's dominance over women at that period in history. And she's locked away and she goes slowly insane. Well, you're not sure if she goes insane because you don't know if she's going insane because she's told she's insane or if she is genuinely going insane and these guys have picked up on it or if there's something else, there's something supernatural going on in the room that she's locked in. But she's uh, she becomes obsessed with the design in this yellow wallpaper and sees things in there. And when I first read it, I just thought it was a brilliant piece of Victorian weird fiction. I absolutely adored it. And then as I got a little bit older and read it another couple of times, I could see more about politics and religion and gender in it. And I, personally, I think it's a really important uh, work. And I've, I've given copies to some of my ardent feminist friends and said like you want to have a look at that that says a lot but on the kindle version she also likes prosecco the music of abba and has terrible difficulties with all the men in her life which actually that last one's quite true but one thing i really love about it is it's not even like yellow wallpaper i think it's the side of a yellow shipping container yeah, it just doesn't equate at all. So I'll leave it there for now. I don't want to ramble on about bad and bizarre book covers too much. But if you've enjoyed this, let me know because I have loads of these saved on my uh, on my computer. So thank you for watching, guys. Uh, I'm I've I've been doing this channel well I've been I've had the channel longer than a year but I've been doing horror book blurb for about a year um and I know it's uh, changed up a little bit like my format's changed I kind of found my feet a little bit now so I think for a year I'm going to do a Q&A if anybody's interested and you can ask me out so leave a comment which is your question, what I'm going to do for the ne next couple of weeks on videos, I'm going to mention that I'm doing a Q&A, so I'll let a few, a couple of weeks worth of uh, questions accumulate, and uh, then I shall just crack on with that. So thank you for watching, guys, and uh, if you're just here for books, I'll see you next Wednesday, but if you're here for vinyl as well, I'll see you on Sunday. And uh, in the meantime, you lot stay safe.